Welcome to the second uh, hour of our show with Dr. Rock Brenner. And just before the show, uh, he got interrupted because we were cutting for from the first hour to the second hour, and he was explaining his new book, uh, Braver New World, and uh, addressing many of the medical changes that are happening in the world. And I do hope, Dr. Brenner, you will add a chapter on nano delivery systems and also gene therapy and how it's difficult to see if it that gene therapy not only will benefit you but also cover up your ancient genes. Uh, so I, I, I do look forward to that book. Uh, with you because I, I think uh, you are so detailed in bringing out the history and the vitality of that subject. Uh, I really look forward to reading it in the near future. Um, on this second hour, Dr. Brenner uh, wrote a book, uh, Empire and Odyssey, The Brenners in Far East, Russia and Beyond. And I wanted him to discuss that book and bring out certain points of the book because the Brenner family, we all realize uh, who his father was and his mother. Both of them were actors and actresses within the, the Hollywood community. Uh, but at the, the same time, it's where uh, they had, uh, a, especially his father, a deep foundation uh, in Russia and the Mongolian and uh, Chinese histories within that family that made him himself. And at the same time, it's it's very important because he had has the nickname uh, Rock uh, from uh, his father, Yul Brenner, uh, liking the uh, boxer, Rocky Graziano. And in this process, though, when you went to uh, Vladivostok, and uh, correct me if I'm saying it wrong because I honestly don't know how to say it, uh, in Far East Russia, uh, where your family's roots are from, as with many generations there uh, to you, uh, your name means in Russian dynasty. Excuse me, destiny. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I really yeah, screwed destiny. up. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's destiny, destiny. destiny. But you're coming yeah. into your own dynasty. <laughs> uh, but uh, destiny, I think, is uh, very important because um, you brought forth in this book, uh, Empire and Odyssey, uh, the lives of four people which were all of your relatives that made you you and you covered four generations and even the the initial generation where you start with Jules Brenner uh the generations to the first uh Brenner or uh, the first line to me uh would be uh phenomenal that way uh so uh without further ado let me ask you to ex- Explain the four cornerstones of the four generations of Brenners. Yes, um, I'm. I'm not sure the four cornerstones. Nor again, uh, I'm not simply the descendant of the Brenners. I'm a descendant of my mother's family as well. Yes. yes. And so this is the four cornerstones are. <laughs> only make up half the structure but mm-hmm. and the fourth of those cornerstones is myself no this is a story uh, of beginning with my great grandfather Jules Brenner who was Swiss fully Swiss born near Geneva Switzerland although he was of German Swiss family but they lived near Geneva and he spoke primarily French uh, at the age of 14, Jules Brenner uh, shipped out. His brother worked for a famous shipping company in Zurich named Danzig. And through Danzig, Jules Brenner shipped out as a cabin boy on a ship from Marseille. They had fi- helped him find this position on a private ship. And he set out, and he was the cook on this ship, Uh, This is, by the way, Jules was born in 1849, and this was when he was about 14, 15 years old, uh, in about 1863, mid-Civil War in the United States. And as he shipped out from Marseille uh, and then around the Horn of Africa to Shanghai, 
Uh, periodically, he was locked in the galley of the ship where he cooked, and he would hear gunfire up above and even cannon fire, and gradually he realized that he was the cook on a pirate ship headed to Shanghai, and the, his, his ship was stopping other ships coming from the Far East uh, and stealing their silk, their opium, and their tea and variety of spices. So Zhu got off the ship in Shanghai. He had a great facility for languages, and he spoke both English, French, and German when he arrived, he soon spoke at least two dialects of Chinese, and he got work in the silk trade, of which Shanghai was the center of the silk that was produced in China and then was sent by the Chinese to Japan to be dyed because the Japanese had a unique process and unique dyes um, mm -hmm. to use on silk. So the company stationed Zhu in Nagasaki, Japan, where as an 18-year-old, he became a critical figure in a one-man shipping agency owned by an Englishman uh, who soon died. And Zhu inherited this shipping company, which meant they didn't own ships. They simply took bookings for items to be shipped and then found space on ships and put the two together. And that was Zhu's business, but he was very, very good at it. And at this point, the Russian government had created, had sent 43 sailors to the Far East to, um, to make a Russian voice in it, the land that it had e recently acquired from China in 1859. And the rest of the European nations were gradually colonizing Africa and the Far East. England had Shanghai, Hong Kong, um, Spain had the Philippines, the Dutch had Indonesia, and Russia wanted a piece of this too. And they actually... Russian soil actually met the Pacific Ocean there. And so Russia sent 43 sailors to create a permanent naval port and announcing their forceful intentions, they named this port Vladivostok, which in Russian means the power of the East, which was pretty presumptuous of 43 Russian sailors <laughs> to call themselves the power of the East up against Japan and China and all these other powers. Um, but it also warned the Japanese that there was trouble brewing for them down the road. Anyway, this naval base did not attract civilians and civilian companies. So in about 1870... Uh, the government of Russia in St. Petersburg, the Tsar, declared this new naval port to be a Porto Franco, meaning that any business that set its headquarters there would pay no taxes. And it was that that attracted Jules Brenner to move his sh small shipping company headquarters from Japan to Vladivostok. He settled there, uh, about 15 years after the very first Russian sailors, uh, when the population was just a few hundred people. And Jules, together with a handful of extraordinary European gentlemen and investors and bankers and businessmen, fulfilled their ambition of building a completely European city in the middle of Asia. And that's what Vladivostok was, and that's what it is today. And it was there that Jules and his Russian wife uh, had six children. His Russian wife, by the way, was part Buryat, 
Buryats is the name known as the descendants of Genghis Khan. And funnily enough, in the last 20 years with DNA analysis, we have determined that that's exactly right. But in fact, um, those who are Buryats uh, are indeed shared the genetic uh, lines. Uh, this through the, especially made clear through the National Ge uh, Geographic uh, Genomic Program, tracing uh, DNA. Right, and th that's so important because uh, you really don't know who you're related to in the ancestral line sometimes. Well, yes, that's true. Well, in your case, it confirmed. It confirmed. Well, it, it's... Uh, <laughs> I didn't... <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by it confirmed. It, it, what it did confirm was that Yule, who was a thoroughly European man, it was mm -hmm. really only his roles, especially as the king of Siam and even pharaoh of all Egypt, uh, that gave him uh, an oriental cast to many people's eyes. But before he played the king and I, he, there was nothing especially Asian about him. Um, but, um, but anyway, his grandmother was in fact uh, part Buryat, and so am I, proudly. Um, anyway, Jules' children were born in Vladivostok, and his son, Jules' son, Boris, also married a Russian woman, and in 1920, uh, her son was born named Yule, uh, after the name of Jules, obviously, the, uh, his grandfather, who died just three months before Yule was actually born. So he never actually knew Jules. Jules by then had created a vast shipping empire, a vast timber business, shipping huge amounts of wood on his ships uh, all throughout the Pacific Basin from Australia to Vancouver to San Francisco and South America. And so uh, this empire, of course, was uh, imminently threatened uh, by the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. The Brinner Mining Company, he had also created these vast mines about 300 miles north of Vladivostok in an ancient Chinese village called Tetuhe. Uh Actually, it wasn't even a village. It was just a name on a map. And he found lead, zinc, and silver mines there in 1896. So his second son, Boris, uh, became a mining engineer. That's my grandfather. And he would take over the Brinner mines. Well, the Bolshevik Revolution interfered with that to some degree as did World War I, because most of their mining engineers were from Germany, and they were immediately expelled when Russia went to war with Germany in 1914. Uh, and so, um, uh, um, Boris remained, uh, kept trying as, uh, most of the Brinners remained, uh, as the Russian Civil War broke out between the Communist Reds and the Imperial White Russians, uh, the Russian Civil War lasted from 1918 until 1922, and indeed the last battle of the Russian Civil War was in Vladivostok, directly in front of the railroad station, which was also right in front of the Brenner residence, where Yule, mm -hmm. at the age of two, was listening to all the gunfire in the street a hundred yards away or less. And on October 25, 1922, Russia ceased to exist and became the Soviet Union. 
So for decades, uh, Vladivostok even was known throughout the Soviet era, Vladivostok was known as the last city in Russia, the last city to submit to Soviet domination. The Brinner family fled uh, soon after. Yule was seven uh, in 1927 when he and his mother and uh, he and his sister, he had an extraordinary older sister named Vera, four years older than Yule, an extraordinary opera singer. Yule and Vera and their mother Mara fled Vladivostok for the nearby Chinese city of Harbin, and they lived there from uh, 1927 until 1931. And what happened with them was that they were progressively uh, forced out by one invasion after another. The Bolsheviks seized Vladivostok and the family fled to China. Then that city in China was seized in 1931 by the Japanese. And the Brinners fled again to the main place where most white Russians settled after the Russian Revolution, and that was Paris. And so at the age of 11, Yule and his mother, sister and mother settled in Paris and remained there uh, off and on uh, from 1931, 32, until Paris was invaded by Hitler's forces in 1940. And then the family fled, or actually Yule, uh, Yule brought his mother, who was by then dying of leukemia, uh, to the United States to join his sister, uh, who was already living in New York. And he came with an opportunity to learn to study acting with Michael Chekhov, the nephew of playwright Anton Chekhov. Uh, and so that is how the Brinners traveled from uh, Switzerland to Vladivostok, Russia. Well, actually first to Japan, to Vladivostok. Actually, for a period of Yule's teenage years, he spent every summer, unbelievably enough, in North Korea because part of the Brinner family, when they fled the Bolsheviks, went just a hundred miles south of Vladivostok into northern Korea and created a Russian hunting lodge there that included my grandfather, Boris. And that's where my father spent several of his teenage summers, uh, hunting bear and uh, wild uh, hogs and um, and a variety of other animals um, in North Korea, strangely enough. Although at that time, Korea was a unified country. It, there was no right. North Korea, just Northern Korea. Right. <laughs> and it's just amazing how from your family, it went from uh, really north, south, east, west of our compass direction in um, always being, I'm going to say, at the doorway of a battle and having to move. And many European families uh, made the choice to leave their homelands to avoid uh, wars and avoid uh, situations like that. And uh, it's it's amazing how it, when you told the story, how it, it seemed to follow it, well, follow the it, family. It, it was an amazing story for me to learn about. My father was a man of action, not reflection, and he did not mm -hmm. look back. I was his only son and his only child until I was about 15 when, my first, when I began having half-sisters uh, and when my first half-sister was born. And... Um, uh, so I, I eventually demanded that my father tell me exactly the story because he had invented a million stories. Basically, every time he had an interview, he invented a new story about the Brinners and where he came from. 
largely because he understood that it was such a complicated story, the press was never going to get it right anyway. Uh, and so he changed the place of his birth, even on his passport. He had a false place of birth. Uh, and there was an interesting reason for that, too, but it's a long, silly story, really. Um, and um, and so for one magazine, he was of gypsy descent. Another, he was descended from Taji Khan uh, of Genghis Khan descent. And he invented a whole new story every time. Eventually, I got the story straight from him, uh, but it, 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 there, as with most families of the Russian diaspora and of other national and ethnic diasporas, uh, it doesn't really do much good to look back. You know, it, none of us imagined that the Soviet Union would ever collapse altogether. None of us really imagined, none of us baby boomers, that the Cold War would ever end. And so thinking back to the old country, uh, when it could never be visited again and would never be anything similar to what it had been, really was, was pointless. So the Brinners, like many diaspora families, simply didn't look back. And so that part of my heritage really just lived you sort of put it up in the attic and never looked at it again. But what happened to me that was so remarkable and for which I'm so eternally grateful is that in 2003, sitting on my hilltop in Pauling, New York, with a westerly view toward the Catskill Mountains, I suddenly received an email from the city of Vladivostok. And the email was to invite me to the first Vladivostok International Film Festival to present the first Yul Brynner Award in the city where he was born. And that email ended with the sentence, Your name, Rok, in Russian means destiny, and it is your destiny to come to Vladivostok. So... Um, after some organization, I, um, I eventually arranged to attend the festival. Uh, I went, actually, I was sent by the U.S. State Department to give lectures on the U.S. Constitution uh, in Russia as part of the State Department's International Speakers Program in Public Diplomacy, that is, people-to-people -people diplomacy as opposed to through diplomats. And so uh, in September 2003, I made my first trip to Vladivostok, which was also my first trip to Russia, and was welcomed <laughs> with extraordinary warmth and welcomed as the descendant of the founder of the city, Jules Brinner. Wow. That's wonderful. And it's a city that at its peak had a population of almost a million. Uh, the population of Russia itself is a, a population crisis, a demographic crisis, because in fact every year there are a million less Russians. Oh. Because the, um, the life expectancy for a man in Russia is 59 as opposed to the United States where it's 77 or Japan where it's 83. Um, and there's also a tremendous emigration from Russia, many Russians leaving the country, and uh, very, very few families having more than one or at most two children, a very, very low birth rate. So the population across Russia is shrinking. So now Vladivostok has a population of about 600,000. But I fell in love with the city and participated, in, and I've now been there a dozen times uh, in the last eight years. And I'm returning. Uh, I've been to each of the film festivals, but I've also been there 
uh, on as part of an environmental conference uh, representing the United States, and uh, I've, I've I've done a vast amount of work lecturing. I'm now involved in helping to set up. I'm a professor of history, by the way, right. uh, and I'm currently helping set up a new university in Vladivostok, the Far East Federal University, and setting up their program for teaching American history. And oh, uh, uh, I, I'm involved in the city in a variety of ways, and it's a great joy and pleasure to me. And I will be returning for the ninth Vladivostok Film Festival next uh, in September, two months from now. And I'm glad to say I'm taking my lifelong friend and childhood sweetheart and my dear best buddy, Liza Minnelli. Oh, wonderful. And I'm bringing Liza to I'm bringing Liza to Vladivostok. Oh, she that's has, wonderful. Yeah, it's it's a big thrill and easily the biggest star ever to <laughs> visit the Russian Far East. And, of course, Liza, Liza and I were in boarding school from the age of nine. She was the first girl I ever kissed while dancing to Debbie Reynolds singing Tammy uh, in 1956. And, um, and we've remained very close friends through... <laughs> Uh, a total of seven marriages between us uh, with no children, which for myself I consider a blessing. Uh, but we've, we've been all around the world together and we remain the very closest of, of friends. So anyway, she's, she's coming to Vladivostok too. Oh, I, I think that's wonderful because yes. you can show uh, her the area and... Uh, yes, it, it, and the house where Ewell Brenner was born... Part of yes. the mystery for, you know, I mean, there has never been a more mysterious movie star than Yule Brynner. Nobody could mm-hmm. ever guess where he came from. Nobody could even imagine where he came from. And his profusion of invented stories only added to the mystery. Uh, but in fact, he was born in an extraordinarily beautiful, privately owned three-story house uh, that has an amazing, uh, uh, very modernist design. It was really Art Nouveau architecture uh, mm-hmm. from a German architect that Jules Brinner brought to Vladivostok. The house was built in 1910, and Ewell was born there 10 years later. And I have stood in the room where my dad was born, something mm-hmm. neither he nor I imagined would be possible even when he died 26 years ago in, in 1985. When when you went uh, back to uh, to Vladivostok, um, did you feel like your soul was home? Because sometimes you feel that, uh, as I call it, like just an inner knowing. You just feel good in that area. I don't know if you've experienced that well, or not. Well, uh, the, the truth is I... I was welcomed with such extraordinary and very you were special with love. warmth that mm-hmm. um, I would have felt that in any city where I was welcomed that warmly. I see. I see. But it was much know, more what, than that. Be- what was special and unique was that wherever I went, and even now, wherever I go in the city, and even by email. Wherever I would go, people would gather, and I'd come back to my hotel lobby, and there would be three or four people at least, each with a small anecdote uh, about the Brinner family that they'd heard over their dinner table when they were children, and that were whispered throughout the Soviet era, because uh, the Soviets did not wish to give any credit whatsoever to an industrial capitalist like Jules Brinner for building the city. But the population knew perfectly well that that's what had happened and returned to the older part of the city that Jules helped build. And I say virtually all the bricks that built the city of Vladivostok were brought from Hamburg, Germany, 
uh, on Brenner owned ships. So I mean, I, the city really was built by Zhu brought the materials for a city yeah. and built it there. And everyone knew that. So mm-hmm. I would hear these funny little anecdotes and people would wait a long time just to give me this story or that. And I thought, you know, how do they know I'm a writer? How do they know I'm actually a professor of history who loves this stuff? And... um the truth is they weren't doing it really for my sake at all. They were doing it to sort of fulfill an obligation to the mother or grandmother from whom they'd heard this little snippet. For them, it was the completion of that. Now, it didn't have to be whispered. Um, They could come to my hotel and tell me flat out and tell me funny little stories. I actually met uh, the granddaughter of my father's nanny. Uh, She was suddenly waiting for me and had a picture of of her grandmother with my father as a baby. Uh, and, And then funny little snippets. One woman came just to tell me that my great grandfather, Jules, was close friends with the only American who lived in Vladivostok, and that his name was Mr. Gray. And then she added, well, of course, as if I knew, she added, well, of course, you know, his his name wasn't really Mr. Gray, it was really Mr. Black, but he married a Miss White, so they changed their name to Gray. (laughs) And she told me this story, you know, completely straight-faced, just as a matter of history. So everywhere I went in Vladivostok, I had these amazing little anecdotes and stories, millions of them, and they're still coming. And then documents began arriving uh, when I put up my website, rockbrinner.com, uh, about the Brin- which is entirely about Russia, the Brinners in Russia and Vladivostok. Uh, you can also order my book, Empire and Odyssey, from there. Uh, but uh, when I put my website up, uh, that's when I started hearing from extraordinary people all around the world, from uh, a Dutch historian living in Korea who was studying Russians in Korea, to uh, a French woman whose great-grandfather's diary showed that he had been a mining engineer for my great-grandfather and told of visiting Jules Brenner's house in Vancouver, British Columbia. And that's the first evidence I ever had that the, that he came to North America, uh, which was utterly extraordinary, owned property in the suburb of Victoria. Uh, and all of this absolute news to me and then the largest story which I can't go into here it's too lengthy uh, but how Jules actually triggered the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-1905 which caused the first Russian Revolution of 1905 whereat Stalin, Lenin and Trotsky all met and declared that little revolution of 1905 as the mere dress rehearsal for the Bolshevik revolution that followed 12 years later, that brought down the imperial family of Russia, and that in turn brought down the Brinner Empire in the Russian Far East. Right, because at that time they had a lot of mining contracts in that with the, the Tsar. They had mining contracts, but most of all, uh, there there was an extraordinary timber contract in 1896. Mm -hmm. Korea had been under the thumb of of Japan for off and on 500 years. Korea was something of a slave country to the more powerful Japanese. Uh, Japan was its own nation, had its own king. But uh, the Japanese pretty much controlled the entire peninsula. And 
1896, when the Queen Min of Korea tried to uh, end Japanese domination, the Japanese had her assassinated. And at that point, the king, Kojong, did not live in his own palace. He moved down the street and lived in the Russian embassy for his own safety. And it was there that Jules Brinner visited the king of Korea in 1896 and signed a contract covering approximately half a million acres of land along the Yalu River that divides Korea and Russia for the timber there. And it also entitled him to build a railroad there, to bring in armed forces to protect his business, and to build a telegraph line. As well, the contract with King Kojong allowed Jules Brinner to sell this contract to any respectable Russian businessman. And as it happened the following year, Jules Brinner traveled to St. Petersburg, I should add, Vladivostok is fully 6,000 miles from Moscow and St. Petersburg, twice the width of the United States. We have very little idea, but uh, fully 11% of the land of, of the planet Earth's land is Russia. It is a vast country. It takes 10 hours to fly from Moscow to Vladivostok. Anyway, Jules in 1896, tra 1897, traveled to St. Petersburg, met with Tsar Nicholas, the last Tsar, <clears throat> whom Jules, Jules had already met uh, five years earlier in Vladivostok, and Jules sold this vast timber contract known as the Yalu River Timber Contract. He sold that to the Tsar, who bought it with his own personal money. And that so alarmed the Japanese, who controlled Korea. They saw it as the Tsar's plot to bring in his army, under the terms of that contract, into Korea and seize control of Korea from Japan. And so for several years, the Japanese tried to understand uh, what Russian intentions were. Uh, the Russian government refused to even meet with the Japanese. And as a result, in 1903, without warning, late in the night, the Japanese Navy attacked the Russian Navy in all the ports in the Far East and sank a large part of the Russian Navy in in the ports. And there, there in ensued the Russo-Japanese War, which at the time was absolutely, without question, the biggest war in all of human history, with more than a million soldiers on either side, actually on the Russian side. Japan had less, but were far more effective. And... Uh, that war ended only when Russia was pretty much badly defeated. But more than that, the fact that so many Russian men were drafted off the farms produced a terrible uh, famine when harvest time came and the men weren't there to bring in <laughs> the harvest. Mm -hmm. And that famine triggered the revolution of 1905 uh, and uh, that again was the dress rehearsal for the communist revolution that followed 12 years later uh, and which um, produced the Cold War uh, that, that created the world we lived in. So in a very real way, I'm afraid, my great-grandfather's action with the Yalu River timber contract produced, resulted in the Cold War that defined our world, you know, for 50 years and in some ways still defines it today.
you're still there, yes? I'm still here. And, <laughs> okay. And that is uh, that is destiny. It's bringing it all to to different ports. Um, I I I, I listened anyway, to every word you were saying and took beautiful notes mm-hmm. because uh, well, that's uh, that's a true story and um, and again, it was utterly unknown until. I began writing about it, and I was only able to learn the full story. Uh, when I returned from my first trip to Vladivostok, I was kind of feeling my oats, and so I um, I called the Russian embassy in Washington and said, "I'd like to. I've just come back from Vladivostok, and I have an extraordinary family story. I'd like to meet with the ambassador, please." And after a brief pause, his secretary came back and said, when would you like to meet with him? And so I met with then uh, Russian ambassador um, Ushakov in 2003. And then I spoke at the Kennan Institute of Advanced Russian Studies in Washington, which is part of the Woodrow 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 Wilson Center for International Scholars. And I've spoken there several times. And as a result of that, new documents came to me and gradually began arriving, including photographs, all kinds of things. And it's the the things that no other historian, documents that no other historian could have found in the old Soviet archives, um, but that came to me only because I am an historian and I am a Brinner. Mm-hmm. And so it's as a result of that that this story got told. And indeed, had had I not survived uh, my pyoderma gangrenosum in the 1990s, and if thalidomide had not helped save my life, it's a more complicated story than that, but... Uh, Had I not survived the pyoderma, the world would never have been able to know the story that I've told in my book, Empire and Odyssey, which also has, by the way, about 160 photographs, four sections of photographs, uh, 16 uh, pages of photographs for each generation, my great-grandfather, my grandfather, my father, and myself. Yeah, it's and, beautiful. And uh, even has the original house uh, picture that uh, yes, you Father Yul Brenner was born in, et cetera. Yes. It's beautiful done. And it also has beautiful maps uh, so you can follow not only what the story is, meaning what what is being told in the history. And again, uh, Dr. Brenner, the way you write, it, it just unfolds. You can see it in your mind, uh, what you're experiencing not only as your family, but also as what is happening in the, the history and the description of the land. It's it's very uh, very detailed and very well written. And well, uh, I much. personally enjoy that because I like detail. I like to see it in my mind so you can feel it, taste it, and know what it is because that's what a book is. A book mm-hmm. is a temple of knowledge to bring you that knowledge when you cannot travel to that land or to that area. And you do that so well. And uh, with your name being... Uh, destiny and bringing really full circle the destiny of your whole family on both sides, your mother and your father, and all the way to Genghis Khan and beyond. Um, it's, it's to me, amazing uh, that, uh, and also to tell the story, but also if it was not for you, and yes, you went through that disease, that immunological disease, and had to go through uh, so many treatments, so many different things in your life. Um, the thing is that you were the one that had to tell the story because you were the only one that could put it all together. Well, yes. And when you read it and you uh, you know the facts, because each one of these stories of each one of these people, they not only were your blood relatives or anything, but you cared about that. And that's what you can tell from the whole writing of both books, uh, Dark Remedy and also in uh, Empire and Odyssey. 
you care about what you're writing. You care about uh, the, thor- the story of the thalidomiders, the story of, of the citizens of Vladivostok. You, you care about everything so that you try to put the perspective on and the guiding light is truth of what is there. Well, thank you. <laughs> I try to. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, but I it do. is true. <laughs> and um, I, I, I'm very excited uh, about. Uh, you've got many things happening, especially in the next two months of going back uh, to Russia mm-hmm. and experiencing that. And then also with uh, the aspects as you shared earlier of starting a whole university for. Uh, uh, the uh, American Constitution, correct? Mm-hmm. Well, American uh, history uh, or American no, uh, teaching American history in a fed- Russian federal un- university that's being uh-huh. built right now in Vladivostok. Now, the reason for that is that next September in 2012, Russia is the host of the Asian Pacific Economic Conference called APEC, and that is the most important gathering every year of all the Pacific Rim countries. And this is the first time Russia is really um, announcing itself as a Pacific power, much as it did when Zedivostok was named the power of the East 150 years ago. Um, Mm -hmm. And so this conference is hugely important to Russia, and the government contributed $5 billion to producing a conference center for this conference on an an island adjoining the city of Vladivostok, where there was nothing until a year ago. There was nothing but goats living there. And they're they're building this vast complex for a 10-day conference next year, after which this enormous <laughs> venture will become the new federal university. And so it's for that that I'm designing and will participate in and uh, teach <laughs> to some degree, probably by remote uh but uh, certainly I'll be visiting the university and giving lectures mm-hmm. there uh, right. on, <laughs> on American history. And yes, especially uh, my, uh, I'm primarily a constitutional historian, although as a professor I mostly taught 20th century American history. Um, and I do a wide variety of other things as well. I'm a determined and committed uh, Renaissance man. I'm a pilot. I play 12-string guitar. I've started uh, restaurants. The first sushi bar in Malibu, by the way, I'm sure you've passed it many times. Something's fishy. Yeah, uh, I know. I I didn't know you were uh, part of creating it or owning it yes, at all, but I've seen uh, I that name, it. Something Fishy, because I thought that was a brilliant name, Something Fishy. Well, we call, originally we called it Something's Fishy Here, and we opened it in 1977, and uh, it was a huge success from the beginning. And after a couple years, myself and my friends sold the company to uh, a Korean company, who still own it and have made it very successful. It was successful from, from the beginning. And have a second, they have another restaurant in Thousand Oaks and another in Santa Barbara. Uh, mm. But we sold our shares in the company, and that's, uh, that's what allowed me to write my first novel back in 1978-79. Uh, so I, I also helped start... Uh, well, helped early on in the creation of a little hamburger stand in London called the Hard Rock Cafe, uh, which uh, turned out to be quite successful, as you probably know. Yeah, it sure did, uh, and I think it's worldwide now, isn't it? Oh, yes, 103, I think, Hard Rocks around the world now. It's now owned by the Seminole Indian tribe and with their headquarters in Orlando. 
Um, yeah. And it's a vast corporate thing, but we were initially just a handful of hippies who couldn't find a good burger in London. In, by the way, June 1971, 40 years ago last month, June 7th, 1971, was the opening of the first Hard Rock Cafe uh, at Hyde Park Corner, where it still is open today, 40 years later. It's just wow. un- unimaginable for us. <laughs> we had a two-year lease on the building at Hyde Park Corner because the land had been bought by the reclusive Howard Hughes, who was living in the penthouse of the adjoining Inn on the Park Hotel and had plans, he and or his Mormon entourage, had a plan to build a giant new development right at Hyde Park Corner. So they were, they leased it to us for two years and promised they were going to tear down the building after two years. So we were a fly-by-night operation. We expected to last exactly 24 months and then get out of town. So we were a little lax about things like, oh, getting work permits for the American kids who worked there in the summer or for, oh, I don't know, paying taxes, <laughs> that kind of thing. And then suddenly we became such an institution there that uh, we had to clean up our act and become a serious business, and that's what happened. And it became a very serious business indeed, no doubt about that. So I, I've i had a vast uh, variety of experiences, and that's what I still aim to do in coming years. Well, like your grandfather, you're uh, very creative and uh, see the opportunity of business. And I want to thank you again very much for being on the show. And please do look at uh, Dr. Brenner's uh, website uh, so that you can order his books and other new uh, projects that he may be involved with. Well, uh, thank you, Hildy. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me on your show. I'm uh, delighted to have participated, and I admire what you do, and I especially like your bachi uh, uh remedies. Um, and, oh, thank you. Um, I look forward to seeing you the next time I'm in California. You've got it. Okay? All right. Thank you Take very care. much. You're most welcome. Take care. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Informed, enlightened, alive and amplified. This is the Living Light Network. Uh, To Shanghai, uh, periodically he was locked in the galley of the ship where he cooked, and he would hear gunfire up above and even cannon fire, and gradually he realized that he was the cook on a pirate ship headed to Shanghai, and the, his, his ship was stopping other ships coming from the Far East uh, and stealing their silk, their opium, and their tea and variety of spices. So Zhu got off the ship in Shanghai. He had a great facility for languages, and he spoke both English, French, and German when he arrived, he soon spoke at least two dialects of Chinese, and he got work in the silk trade, of which Shanghai was the center of the silk that was produced in China and then was sent by the Chinese to Japan to be dyed because the Japanese had a unique process and unique Uh, But the destiny, I think, is uh, very important because um, you brought forth in this book, uh, Empire and Odyssey, um, the lives of four people, which were all of your relatives that made you you, and you covered four generations, and 
even the the initial generation where you start with Jules Brenner, uh, the generations to the first uh, Brenner or uh, the first line to me uh, would be uh, phenomenal that way. Uh, so, uh, without further ado, let me ask you to explain the four cornerstones of the four generations of Brenners. Yes, um, I'm. I'm not sure the four cornerstones. Nor again, uh, I'm not simply the descendant of the Brenners. I'm the descendant of my mother's family as well. Yes. Yes. And so this is the four cornerstones are <laughs> only make up half the structure. Welcome to the second uh, hour of our show with Dr. Rock Brenner. And just before the show, uh, he got interrupted because we were cutting for from the first hour to the second hour, and he was explaining his new book, uh, Braver New World, and uh, addressing many of the medical changes that are happening in the world. And I do hope, Dr. Brenner, you will add a chapter on nano delivery systems and also gene therapy and how it's difficult to see if it, that gene therapy not only will benefit you but also cover up your ancient genes. Uh, so I, I, I do look forward to that book. Mm-hmm. Uh, with you because I, I think uh, you are so detailed in bringing out the history and the vitality of that subject. Uh, I really look forward to reading it in the near future. Um, on this second hour, Dr. Brenner uh, wrote a book, uh, Empire and Odyssey, The Brenners in Far East, Russia and Beyond. And I wanted him to discuss that book and bring out certain points of the book because the Brenner family, we all realize uh, who his father was and his mother. Both of them were actors and actresses within the, the Hollywood community. Uh, but at the the same time, it's where uh, they had, uh, a, especially his father, a deep foundation uh, in Russia and the Mongolian and uh, Chinese histories within that family that made him himself. And at the same time, it's it's very important because he had has the nickname uh, Rock uh, from uh, his father, Yul Brenner, uh, liking the uh, boxer, Rocky Graziano. And in this process, though, when you went to uh, Vladivostok, and uh, correct me if I'm saying it wrong because I honestly don't know how to say it, uh, in Far East Russia, uh, where your family's roots are from, as with many generations there uh, to you, uh, your name means in Russian dynasty. Excuse me, destiny. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I really yeah, screwed destiny. up. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's des- destiny. destiny. But you're coming yeah. into your own dynasty. But, mm-hmm. And the fourth of those cornerstones is myself. No, this is a story uh, of beginning with my great-grandfather, Jules Brenner, who was Swiss, fully Swiss, born near Geneva, Switzerland, although he was of German-Swiss family, but they lived near Geneva, and he spoke primarily French. Um, At the age of 14, Jules Brenner uh, shipped out. His brother worked for a famous shipping company in Zurich named Danzig, and through Danzig, Jules Brenner shipped out as a cabin boy on a ship from Marseille, they had fi- helped him find this position on a private ship, and he set out. And he was the cook on this ship. Uh, this is, by the way, Jules was born in 1849, and this was when he was about 14, 15 years old, uh, in about 1863, mid Civil War in the United States. <clears throat> And as he shipped out from Marseille um, and then around the Horn of Africa, 